Good morning. In our gathering today, we come together as a community in a time-honored Westminster College tradition. Out of respect for this tradition, we ask that all cell phones be silenced now. I now declare this John Finley Green Foundation lectureship open. Please remain standing for the invocation and please remove your hats. Let us pause in a spirit of reflection and prayer. Holy One, in a world racked by war and woundedness, your spirit moves in the voices of those who are willing to speak up and speak out, in the feet of the activist who stands on the front lines of protest, who empowers the marginalized, who seeks liberty for the oppressed. You reveal your divine presence again and again. In the chanting of the ally, the advocate, the one who speaks truth to power, who does not accept easy answers or bow to displays of institutional might, we glimpse the holy, see the glimmer of the world you hope for, the world you are calling us to create. It is a world of peace, a world of justice, a world where all people and all creation flourishes. And it is through those who march, those who preach and teach, those who sing and hold signs through scholars and prophets, students and seekers, politicians and poets, through all those who lend their voices to the struggle and speak with liberty upon their lips, that you do your divine work, O oh God. May our time here prepare us for this work, this advocacy and activism, this peacemaking and peacekeeping, this ushering in of your divine hope. We pray in the name of all that is holy, all that is good. Amen. You may now be seated. Now I am pleased to introduce the Churchill Singers under the direction of Dr. Natasha Sexton, who will perform America. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 58th John Findlay Green Foundation Lecture at Westminster College. I'm Mark Bolton. I am chair of the History Department and chair of the 2017 Hancock Symposium. Today is one of those very rare and special days in our history that makes Westminster so unique and relevant. We've had some of the most influential world leaders grace our campus in the past. We do it again today, and we will continue to do so. It is in our DNA. It is what we do best. I would like to thank you, all of you who have joined us for this important occasion, including members of the Westminster Board of Trustees, faculty, staff and students, and everyone watching this lecture on live stream, as well as some other special guests who I will now have the privilege of introducing you to. We are honored to have Matthew Dust and Ari Rabinhaft from Senator Sanders' office, and Samantha Brewer and Zoe Brewer from our own United States Senator Claire McCaskill's office. We are pleased to welcome the Mayor of Fulton, Leroy Benton, and City Manager Bill Johnson this year as well. However, it is indeed a special privilege to recognize three members of the John Findlay Green family who have come to honor the memory of the man for whom this lecture was named. The first member of the family is the great-grandson of John Findlay Green, John Findlay Green II, who graduated from Westminster in 1975 and is a member of Phi Delta Theta. Other members of the Green family present are Kathleen Green Henry and her husband, Robert Henry. Kathleen, the great-granddaughter of John Findlay Green, is an attorney in the law firm he started in 1901, which is now known as the Great Rivers Environmental Law Firm. Robert works for the Missouri History Museum. We have not had the honor of a member of the Green family attending the Green Foundation Lecture for at least 25 years and possibly longer. So would you please stand and would you give me a proper Westminster welcome to our guests today. Thank you, and thank you to all our special guests for joining us today. Next, it is my privilege to introduce to you our platform party. Our platform party, starting from my far right, is comprised of college chaplain and instructor of religious studies, the Reverend Jamie Haskins, and Dr. David Jones, acting senior vice president and dean of faculty. On my left is Westminster's acting president, Dr. Carolyn Perry, our honored lecturer, US Senator Bernie Sanders, and Lana. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> and Lana Zarer, class of 1995, and a member of our Board of Trustees. Behind our platform party is a group of Westminster students who have distinguished themselves as leaders on campus. This is my last act as symposium chair, so I would like to once again just thank everyone who has worked so hard in bringing this thing together. And with that, and at this time, I would like to ask President Perry to come forward for some opening remarks and to introduce our 58th Green Foundation lecturer, Senator Bernie Sanders. Welcome. Welcome, Westminster family and friends, to this exciting occasion, the 58th John Finley Green Foundation lecture. When Eleanor Green so generously established this foundation in memory of her husband, an 1884 alumnus of the college, the purpose was to bring people of international reputation to campus to lecture on topics that promote understanding of economic and social problems and of international concern. I doubt that she envisioned at that time that the allure of this opportunity would draw presidents and prime ministers advocates and ambassadors, cabinet members, corporate CP CEOs, and other luminaries of all professions to this small Midwestern liberal arts campus. But it did. And we are proud of the rich role Westminster has been able to play in our country's history. Because colleges and universities as seats of knowledge should be a forum for the entire spectrum of ideas 
and most of all, offer the inspiration and vision to transform its students into the leaders of a new generation. We see this time and time again as the Westminster Experience helps students who come here find the power in their purpose. Some of the ver verbiage from the first 1937 Green Lecture by a Canadian economist brings a few chuckles today, such as television is coming over the horizon and soon we'll have the ability to fly around the world in seven days. <laughs> However, the topics discussed are just as timely now as they were then. The benefits and detriments of constantly advancing technology in the American workforce, the divisiveness of politics, internationalist policies versus isolationism, the concentration of wealth, the plight of the American worker. For while cultures change, the challenges and aspirations of humanity are universal. Certainly Sir Winston Churchill's Sinews of Peace lecture, commonly known as the Iron Curtain Address, elevated this lecture series to a height unparalleled. From that moment on, just as today, the eyes of the world have turned to Westminster College to hear words of global significance. It always surprises people to learn that Churchill's words, while widely acclaimed today, were met initially, in some circles anyway, with some alarm and disapproval. However, as the first Green lecturer, Oscar Skelton, said in the introduction to his lecture, it is difficult to look at our own time objectively. Every age has a tendency to exaggerate its achievements and magnify its troubles, to regard itself as the climax of history. Only time reveals the truth, and Churchill's insight was truly prophetic. Since Churchill's momentous lecture, we have seen the Iron Curtain fall, then rise again when Gorbachev gave his lecture here, announcing the end of the Cold War. And now it could be that the Iron Curtain is descending once again. But whatever the state of the human condition, world leaders will continue to make their way to Westminster College, where words and ideas become the wisdom of the ages. So today, we welcome a green lecturer who's someone whose words and ideas electrified millions of voters during the 2016 race for the White House. Many Americans had previously been complacent about government, and particularly our young people, and they got excited about his fresh takes on the issues and the passion with which he expressed them, and they became engaged. United States Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont is the longest serving independent member of Congress in American history. Having served 16 years in the U.S. House of Representatives and now in his fifth year of the second term in the State Senate, in the United States Senate. Throughout his distinguished public service career, he has focused on the shrinking American middle class, the growing income and wealth gaps in our country, and as chairman of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs in 2014, Senator Sanders passed legislation to reform VA health care. Today he remains on that committee, and he is the ranking member of the Senate Budget Committee. Just last week, he made headlines with his proposal to reform American health care. He also... <laughs> Senator Sanders, could I ask you to please step forward? <laughs> Senator Sanders, before we hear your lecture today, we have a very special honor to bestow upon you. The Board of Trustees of Westminster College has moved to grant you an honorary degree. It is now my privilege to present U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders for the degree of Doctor of Political Science. In the name of Westminster College and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees and by the State of Missouri, I hereby confer upon you, Senator Bernie Sanders, 
the honorary degree of Doctor of Political Science with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In recognition thereof, I deliver you this diploma, duly signed and sealed, and direct that you be vested with the hood, which is the symbol of this degree. We believe that you will bear this degree with distinction to yourself and with honor to our college. Now, please join me once again in giving a rousing Westminster welcome to this dedicated public servant, our 2017 Green Foundation lecturer, Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and let me let me begin by congratulating Westminster College, which year after year invites political leaders to discuss the important issues of foreign policy and America's role in the world. And I want to particularly thank uh, Dr. Perry, the faculty, the staff, and the students here at Westminster for this wonderful honor that you are bestowing on me, and not only the honorary degree, but just the ability to be with you this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the reasons that I accepted the invitation to speak here is that I strongly believe that not, not only do we need to begin a more vigorous debate about foreign policy, but we also need to broaden our understanding of what foreign policy really is. So let me be clear. Foreign policy is directly related to military policy and has everything to do with, with almost 7,000 young Americans being killed in Iraq and Afghanistan and tens of thousands coming home wounded in body and in spirit from a war we never should have gotten into. That is foreign policy, and foreign policy is about hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children in Iraq and Afghanistan dying in that same war. That's foreign policy. Foreign policy is about U.S. government budget priorities at a time when we already spend more on defense than the next 12 countries combined. Foreign policy is about authorizing a defense budget of some $700 billion, including a $50 billion increase passed just last week, without, I should say, a whole lot of discussion. Meanwhile, at the exact same time, as the President and many of my Republican colleagues want to substantially increase military spending, they want to throw 32 million Americans off of the health insurance they currently have because supposedly they are worried about the budget deficit. While greatly increasing military spending, they also want to cut education, environmental protection, and the needs of our children and senior citizens. Foreign policy, therefore, is remembering what President Dwight D. Eisenhower said as he left office, quote, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwanted, warranted influence, whether sought or unsought, 
by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist, end of quote. And Eisenhower also reminded us, and let me quote him again, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete highway. End of quote. That is what Dwight D. Eisenhower said over 50 years ago, and if anything, it is truer today. <laughs> Foreign policy is about whether we continue to champion the values of freedom, democracy, and justice, values which have been a beacon of hope for people throughout the world, or whether we support undemocratic, repressive regimes which torture, jail, and deny basic rights to their citizens. That's foreign policy. What foreign policy also means is that if we are going to expound the virtues of democracy and justice abroad and be taken seriously, we need to practice those values here at home. And that means continuing the struggle to end racism, sexism, xenophobia and homophobia here in the United States and making it clear that when people in America march on our streets as neo-Nazis or white supremacists or anti-Semites, we have no ambu ambiguity in condemning everything they stand for. There are There are no two sides on that issue. And foreign policy is not just tied to military affairs. It is directly connected to economics. Foreign policy must take into account the outrageous income and wealth inequality that exists globally and in our own country. This planet will not be secure or peaceful when so few have so much and so many have so little. And when we advance day after day into an oligarchic form of society where a small number of extraordinarily powerful and wealthy special interests exert enormous influence over the economic and political life of this country and the entire world. There is no moral or economic justification for the six, six wealthiest people in the world having as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's population 3.7 billion people. There is no justification for the incredible power and dominance that Wall Street, giant multinational corporations, and international financial institutions have over the affairs of sovereign countries throughout the world. 
at a time when climate change is causing devastating problems here in the United States and around the world. Foreign policy is about whether we work with the international community, with China, Russia, India, and countries all over this world to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Sensible foreign policy understands that climate change is a real threat to every country on Earth, that it is not a hoax, and that no country alone can effectively combat it. It is an issue for the entire international community and an issue that the United States should be leading on, not ignoring or denying. My point is that we need to look at foreign policy as more than just the crisis of the day and what appears on CNN tomorrow. That is important, but we need a more expansive view. Almost 70 years ago, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill stood on this campus and gave an historic address known as the Iron Curtain speech in which he framed a conception of world affairs that endured through the 20th century until the collapse of the Soviet Union. In that speech, he defined his strategic concept, and I quote, nothing less than the safety and welfare, the freedom and progress of all the homes and families of all the men and women in all the lands, end of, end of quote. Quote, to give security to these countless homes, he said, they must be shielded from two giant marauders, war and tyranny, end of quote. Now, how do we meet that challenge today? How do we fight for the freedom and progress that Churchill talked about now in the year 2017? At a time of exploding technology and wealth, how do we move away from a world of war, terrorism, and massive levels of poverty into a world of peace and economic security for all? How do we move toward a global e community in which people throughout the planet have decent jobs, have food, clean water, education, health care, and the housing that they need? These are admittedly not easy issues to deal with, but they are questions we cannot afford to ignore. At the outset, I think it is important to recognize that the world of today is very, very different from the world of Winston Churchill back in 1946. Back then, we faced a superpower adversary with a huge standing army, with an arsenal of nuclear weapons, with allies around the world, and with expansionist aims. Today, the Soviet Union no longer exists. Today, we face a different set of threats. We will never forget 9-11. We are cognizant of the terrible attacks that have taken place in capitals all across the world, we are more than aware of the brutality of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and similar terrorist groups. We also face the threat of these groups obtaining weapons of mass destruction, and preventing that from occurring must clearly be a top priority. In recent years, we are increasingly confronted by the isolated dictatorship of North Korea which is making rapid progress in nuclear weaponry and intercontinental ballistic missiles. Yes, we face real and very serious threats to our security, which I will discuss. 
but they are very different than what we have seen in the past, and our response must be equally different. But before I talk about some of these other threats, let me say a few words about a very insidious challenge that undermines our ability to meet other crises and indeed could undermine our very way of life. A great concern that I have is that many in our country are losing faith in our common future and in our democratic values, values that men and women for decades fought and died to preserve. Far too many of our people here in the United States, and in fact people all over the world, are giving up on the promises of self-government, of government by the people, for the people, and of the people, because the promises made to them have simply not been kept. And people in our country and all over the world are losing faith in democracy. In the United States and other countries, a majority of people are working longer hours for low wages. They see big money buying elections, and they see a political and economic elite growing wealthier even as their own children's future grows dimmer. So when we talk about foreign policy and our belief in democracy, at the very top of our list of concerns is the need to revitalize American democracy to ensure that governmental decisions reflect the interests of a majority of our people and not just the few. Whether that few is Wall Street, the military industrial complex, or the fossil fuel industry. We cannot convincingly promote democracy abroad if we do not live it vigorously here at home. Now, maybe, maybe it's because I come from the small state of Vermont, a state that prides itself on town meetings and grassroots democracy, that I strongly agree with Winston Churchill when he stated his belief that, quote, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms, end of quote. <laughs> In both Europe and the United States, the international order which the United States helped establish over the past 70 years, one which put great emphasis on democracy and human rights and promoted greater trade and economic development, is under great strain. Many Europeans are questioning the value of the European Union. Many Americans are questioning the value of the United Nations, of the Transatlantic Alliance, and other multilateral organizations. We also see a rise in authoritarianism and right-wing extremism, both domestic and foreign, which further weakens this order by exploiting and amplifying resentments, stoking intolerance, and fanning ethnic and racial hatreds among those in our societies who are struggling. We saw this anti-democratic effort take place in the 2016 election right here in the United States of America, where we now know that the Russian government was engaged in a massive effort to undermine one of our greatest strengths, the integrity of our elections and our faith in our own democracy. And I must say that I find it rather incredible that when the President of the United States recently spoke before the United Nations on Monday, he did not even mention that outrage. <laughs> the 
Well, I will mention that outrage. And today I say to Mr. Putin, I say to Mr. Putin, we will not allow you to undermine American democracy or democracies around the world. In fact, our goal is to not only strengthen American democracy, but to work in solidarity with supporters of democracy all over the globe, including Russia. In the struggle of democracy versus authoritarianism, we intend to win. When we talk about foreign policy, it is clear that there are some who believe that the United States would be best served by withdrawing from the global community. I disagree. As the wealthiest and most powerful nation on earth, we have got to help lead the struggle to defend and expand a rules-based international order in which law, not might, makes right. We must offer people a vision that one day, maybe not in our lifetimes, but one day in the future, human beings on this planet will live in a world where international conflicts will be resolved peacefully, not by mass murder. How tragic it is that today, while hundreds of millions of people live in abysmal poverty, the arms merchants of the world grow increasingly rich as governments spend trillions of dollars on weapons of destruction. I am not naive or unmindful of history. Many of the conflicts that plague our world are long-standing and are complex. But we must never lose our vision of a world in which, to quote the prophet Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. One of the most important organizations for promoting a vision of a different world is the United Nations. Former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who helped create the UN, called it, and I quote, our greatest hope for future peace. Alone, she said, we cannot keep the peace of the world, but in cooperation with others, we have to achieve this much longed for security, end of quote. Now, it has become fashionable among my colleagues in Congress and elsewhere to bash the United Nations. And yes, the UN needs to be reformed. It can be ineffective, it can be bureaucratic, too slow or unwilling to act even in the face of massive atrocities as we are seeing in Syria right now. But to see only its weaknesses is to overlook the enormously important work the UN does in promoting global health, aiding refugees, monitoring elections, and doing international peacekeeping missions, among other things. All of these activities contribute to reduced conflict to wars that don't have to be ended because they never start. At the end of the day, it is obvious that it makes far more sense to have a forum in which countries can debate their concerns, work out compromises and agreements. Dialogue and debate are far preferable to bombs, poison gas, and war.
Dialogue, however, cannot only take place between foreign ministers or dim diplomats at the United Nations. It should be taking place between people throughout the world at the grassroots le level. Uh, I was mayor, as some of you may know, of the city of Burlington, Vermont in the 1980s. And that was a time when the Soviet Union was our enemy. And during that time, we established a sister city program with the Russian city of Yaroslavl, a program, by the way, which still exists today. And I will never forget, never forget, seeing Russian boys and girls visiting Vermont, getting to know American kids, and becoming good friends. Hatred and wars are often based on fear and ignorance. The way to defeat this ignorance and diminish this fear is through meeting with others and understanding the way they see the world. Good foreign policy means building people-to-people -people relations. We should welcome young people from all over the world, from all over the world and all walks of life to spend time with our young people here in America, while our young people from all income levels should be able to go abroad and meet people from throughout the world. Now, some in Washington continue to argue that, quote, benevolent global hegemony should be the goal of our foreign policy. That the United States, by virtue of its extraordinary military power, should stand astride the world and reshape the world to our liking. I would argue that the events of the past two decades, particularly the disastrous war in Iraq and the instability and destruction it has brought to the region, have utterly discredited that vision. The goal is not for the United States to dominate the world, nor, on the other hand, is our goal to withdraw from the international community and shirk our responsibilities under the banner of America first. Our goal should be global engagement based on partnership rather than dominance, this is better for our security, better for global security, and better for facilitating the international cooperation necessary to meet shared challenges. Now here is a truth that you don't often hear about in the newspapers or on television or in the halls of Congress. But it is a truth that we must face. Far too often, American intervention and the use of American military power has produced unintended consequences which have caused incalculable harm. Yes, it is reasonably easy to engineer the overthrow of a government or a regime. It is far harder, however, to know the long-term impact that that action will have. And let me give you just a very few examples. In 1953, and I would say the vast majority of the American people don't know this, but in 1953, the United States, on behalf of Western oil interests and working with the United Kingdom, supported the overthrow of Iran's elected Iran's elected Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, and the reinstallation of the Shah of Iran, who led a corrupt, brutal, and unpopular government. In other words, we overthrew a democratically elected government, installed an undemocratic, unpopular one. In 1979, the Shah was overthrown by revolutionaries led by Ayatollah Khomeini, and the Islamic Republic of Iran was created. What would Iran look like today if their democratic government had not been overthrown? The 
what impact did that American-led coup have on the entire region? What consequences are we still living with today as a result of that action? That was back in 1953. In 1973, the United States supported the coup against the democratically elected president of Chile, Salvador Allende, which was led, and the coup was led by General Augusto Pinochet. The result of that coup was almost 20 years of brutal authoritarian military rule and the disappearance and the torture of thousands of Chileans and the intensification of anti-Americanism in Latin America. Elsewhere in Latin America, the logic of the Cold War led the United States to support murderous regimes in El Salvador and Guatemala, which resulted in brutal and long-lasting civil wars that killed hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. In Vietnam, based on a discredited domino theory, the United States replaced the French in intervening in a civil war, which resulted in the deaths of millions in, of Vietnamese in support of a corrupt, repressive South Vietnamese government. And we, of course, must never forget that 58,000 brave young Americans also died in that war. Most recently in Iraq, based on a similarly mistaken analysis of the threat posed by Saddam Hussein's brutal regime, the United States invaded and occupied a country in the heart of the Middle East. In doing so, we upended the regional order of the Middle East and unleashed forces across the region and the world that we will be dealing with for decades to come. See, an honorary degree is a great honor, except for <laughs> this particular thing. Look. Now, these are, these are just a few examples, just a few, of American foreign policy and interventionism, which proved to be counterproductive. In other words, politicians can get up and they could give a good speech about how bad a dictator is or regime is, and we're going to go in, and we're going to clean it up. But history tells us that 20 years later or 10 years later, the results are not quite so clear. Now let me give you an example. Having talked about bad foreign policy, destructive foreign policy, the use of military might, which proved to be counterproductive, let me give you an example of an incredibly bold and ambitious American initiative which proved to be enormously successful, in which not one bullet, not one missile was fired. And this is something we must learn from. Shortly after Churchill was right here in Westminster College, the United States developed an extremely radical foreign policy initiative called the Marshall Plan. Think about it for a moment. Think about how radical and bold this was. Historically, when countries won terrible wars, they ex exacted retribution on the vanquished, and that's exactly what happened after World War I. But in 1948, the United States government did something absolutely unprecedented. Now think about it. In World War II, the most destructive war in the history of the war world, a war in which we lost hundreds of thousands of young men and women, in which we ended up defeating the brutality and barbarity of Nazi, Nazi Germany and Japanese imperialism. After all of that, the government of the United States decided not to punish and humiliate the losers. Think about all the hatred, all the bloodshed. Think about the Holocaust. And the United States decided they would not revisit history, and they decided not to punish and humiliate 
the losers. Rather, we help rebuild their economies, spending the equivalent of $130 billion just to re re reconstruct Western Europe after World War II. We also provided them support to reconstruct democratic societies. Again, think about that. Think about how somebody felt that whose husband died in the war and suddenly her tax dollars are going to rebuild the economies of the countries that did so many terrible things to us. But that is what the United States government did. And the result of that was an extraordinary success. Today, Germany, the country of the Holocaust, the country of Hitler's dictatorship, is now a strong democracy and the economic engine of Europe. Despite centuries of hostility, and again, we take this for granted, but despite centuries of hostility, there has not been a major European war since World War II. That is an extraordinary foreign policy success that we have every right to be proud of. Un <laughs> Unfortunately, today, we still have examples of the United States supporting policies that I believe will come back to haunt us. One is the ongoing Saudi war in Yemen. While we rightly condemn Russian and Iranian support for Bashar al-Assad's slaughter in Syria, the United States continues to support Saudi Arabia's destructive intervention in Yemen, which has killed many thousands of civilians and created a humanitarian crisis in one of the region's poorest countries. Such policies dramatically undermine America's ability to advance a human rights agenda around the world and empowers authoritarian leaders who insist that our support for those rights and values is not serious. Now let me say a word about some of the shared global challenges that we face today. First, again, importantly, I would mention climate change. Friends, it is time to get serious about climate change. And again, I emphasize that this is not just an environmental issue, this is a foreign policy issue. Climate change is real. It must be addressed with the full weight of American power, attention, and resources. The scientific community is virtually unanimous in telling us that climate change is real, it is caused by human activity, and it is already causing devastating harm throughout the world. Further, what the scientists tell us is that if we do not act boldly to address this crisis, this planet will see more drought, more floods, and the recent devastation by Hurricanes Harvey and Irma are good examples, more extreme weather disturbances, more acidification of the ocean, more rising sea levels, and as a result of mass migrations of people, there will be more threats to global stability and security. President Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement was not only incredibly foolish and short-sighted, but it will also end up hurting the American economy. The threat of climate change is a very clear example of where American leadership can make a difference. Europe can't do it alone, China can't do it alone, Russia can't do it alone, and the United States can't do it alone. This is a crisis that calls out for strong international cooperation if we are to leave our children and grandchildren a planet that is healthy and habitable. A 
Another challenge that we in the entire world face, as I mentioned earlier, is growing wealth and income inequality and the movement toward international oligarchy. And that means a system in our own country and all over the world in which a small number of billionaires and corporate interests have increased control over the economic life and political life and the media of countries throughout the planet. The movement toward oligarchy is not just an American issue, it is an international issue. Globally, the top 1% now owns more wealth than the bottom 99% of the world's population. In other words, while the very, very rich become much richer, thousands of children die every week in poor countries around the world from easily prevented diseases, diseases that be, could be cured for a few cents in purchasing the medicine those kids need. And hundreds of millions of people live in incredible squalor. Inequality, corruption, oligarchy, and authoritarianism are inseparable. They must be understood as part of the same system and fought in the same way. Around the world, we have witnessed we have witnessed the rise of demagogues who, once in power, use their positions to loot the state of its resources. These kleptocrats, like Putin in Russia, use divisiveness and abuse as a tool for enriching themselves and those loyal to them. But economic inequality is not the only form of inequality that we must address. At as we seek to renew Americans' commitment to promote human rights and human dignity around the world, we must be a living example here at home. We must reject the divisive attacks based on a person's religion, race, gender, sexual orientation, or identity. or their country of origin or their economic status. And when we see demonstrations of neo-Nazism and white supremacy, as we recently did in Charlottesville, Virginia, we must be unequivocal in our condemnation, as our president shamefully was not. And as we... And as we saw here so clearly in St. Louis in the past week, we need serious reforms in policing and the criminal justice system. So that the life of every person is equally valued and protected. We cannot speak with the moral authority the world needs if we do not struggle to achieve the ideal we are holding out for others. One of the places we have fallen short in upholding these ideas is in the war on terrorism. Here I want to be clear. Terrorism is a very, very serious threat as we learned so tragically on September 11, 2001, and so many other countries have experienced similar attacks. But I also want to be clear about something else. As an organizing framework, the global war on terror has been a disaster for the American people and for American leadership. Orienting U.S. national security strategy around terrorism essentially allowed a few thousand violent extremists and terrorists to dictate policy for the most powerful nation on earth. It responds to terrorists by giving them exactly what they want. In addition to draining our resources and distorting our vision, the war on terror has caused us to undermine our own moral standards regarding torture, indefinite detention, and the use of force around the world, using drone strikes and other airstrikes 
that often result in high civilian casualties. A heavy-handed military approach with little transparency or accountability does not enhance our security. In many ways, it only makes the problem worse. We must rethink the old Washington mindset that judges seriousness according to the willingness to use force. One of the key misapprehensions of this mindset is the idea that military force is decisive in a way that diplomacy is not. Yes, military force is sometimes necessary, but always, always as the last resort. And blustery threats of force, while they might make a few columnists happy, can often, often signal weakness as much as strength, diminishing U.S. deterrence, credibility, and security in the process. To illustrate this, I would contrast two recent U.S. foreign policy initiatives, the Iraq War and the Iran Nuclear Agreement. Today, it is now broadly acknowledged that the war in Iraq, which I opposed, was a foreign policy blunder of enormous magnitude. In, in addition to the many thousands who were killed, it created a cascade of instability around the region that we are still dealing with today in Syria and elsewhere, and will be for many years to come. Indeed, had it not been for the Iraq war, ISIS would almost certainly not exist. The Iraq war, as I said before, had unintended consequences. It was intended as a demonstration of the extent of American power. It ended up demonstrating only its limits. In contrast, the Iran nuclear deal advance the security of the United States and its partners, and it did this at a cost of no blood and no treasure, not a nickel. For many years, leaders across the world had become increasingly concerned about the possibility of an Iranian nuclear weapon. What the Obama administration and our European allies were able to do was to get an agreement that froze and dismantled large parts of that nuclear program, put it under the most intensive inspections regime in history, and remove the prospect of an Iranian nuclear weapon from the list of global threats. That is real leadership. That is real power. And that, and that was accomplished without the loss of one life. Just yesterday, the top general of U.S. Strategic Command, General John Hyden, said, and I quote, the facts are that Iran is operating under the agreements that we signed for, end of quote. We now have a four-year record of Iran's compliance going back to the 2013 interim deal. Today, I call on my colleagues in Congress and all Americans. We must protect this agreement. President Trump has signaled his intention to walk away from it, as he did the Paris Agreement. Regardless of the evidence that it is working, this would be a serious mistake. Not only would this potentially free Iran from the limits placed on its nuclear program, it would irreparably harm the United States' ability to negotiate future nonproliferation agreements. Why would any country in the world sign such an agreement with the United States if they knew that a reckless president and an irresponsible Congress might simply discard that agreement 
a few years later. If we are genuinely concerned with Iran's behavior in the region, as I am, the worst possible thing we could do is to break this nuclear deal. It would make all of the problems we face even more difficult to resolve. Another problem that it would make harder to deal with is that of North Korea. Let us understand, North Korea is ruled by one of the worst regimes in the world. For many years, its leadership has sacrificed the well-being of its own people, allowed men, women, and children to starve to death in order to develop nuclear weapons and missile programs in order to protect the Kim family's regime. Their continued development of nuclear weapons and missile capability is a growing threat to the United States and people all over the world. Despite past efforts, they have repeatedly shown their determination to move forward with these weapons in defiance of virtually unanimous international opposition and condemnation. As we saw with the 2015 nuclear agreement with Iran, real U.S. leadership is shown by our ability to develop consensus around shared problems and mobilize that consensus toward a solution, and that is the model we should be pursuing with North Korea. As we did with Iran, if North Korea continues to refuse to negotiate seriously, we should look for ways to tighten international sanctions. This will involve working closely with other countries, particularly China, on whom North Korea relies for some 80 percent of its trade. But we should also continue to make clear that this is a shared problem not to be solved by any one country alone, but by the international community working together. And a, an approach that really uses all the tools of our power, political, economic, civil society, to encourage other states to adopt more inclusive governance will ultimately make us safer. Development aid is not charity. It advances our national security. It is worth noting that the United States military is a stalwart supporter of non-defense diplomacy and development aid. Starving diplomacy and aid will result in greater defense needs later on. U.S. foreign aid should be accompanied by stronger emphasis on helping people gain their political and civil rights to hold oppressive governments accountable to the people. Ultimately, governments that are accountable to the needs of their people will make more dependable partners. Now, here is, here is the bottom line. It's been a long time getting here, but here is the bottom line. And that is my view, that the United States must seek partnerships, not just between governments, but between peoples. A sensible and effective foreign policy recognizes that our safety and welfare is bound up with the safety and welfare of people throughout the world, with, as Churchill stated, quote, all the homes and families of all the men and women in all the lands. In my view, every person on this planet shares a common humanity. We all want our children to grow up healthy, to have a good education, to have decent jobs, to drink clean water, and to breathe clean air, and to live in peace. That is what being human is about. Our job is to build on that common humanity and do everything that we can to oppose all of the forces whether unaccountable government power or unaccountable corporate power, who try to divide us up and set us against each other. 
As Eleanor Roosevelt reminded us, the world of the future is in our making. Tomorrow is now. My friends, let us go forward and build that tomorrow. Thank you very much. Well, we certainly thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for living up to the rich tradition of our great leaders who have come to Westminster to deliver these messages of significance in our lives and in the world we live in today. It has been a great privilege to have you with us today. And now I would like to ask Tim Riley, the director and chief curator of the National Churchill Museum, to come forward with a special presentation to Senator Sanders from the college. Tim, please come forward. Senator. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Senator Sanders, for that wonderful talk. Um, we have something for you to remember us by. Uh, this is a ticket, an original ticket, uh, to admit one to the Green Foundation lecture on March 5th, 1946, here at Westminster College. <laughs> May the, ticket, may the ticket be a reminder uh, of your time with us today uh, and a ticket to return any time. Thank you. What an afternoon it has been. And now I'd like to ask that you all stand as Junior Destiny Speech will lead us in the alma mater. Thank you, Destiny. Please join me in the sing singing of the Westminster College alma mater. The words are in the back of your programs, in your programs. remain standing for this benediction. The holy moves in our midst. It is the voice of an advocate demanding a better world, the hands and heart of an activist laboring for justice, for peace, the mind of a student who dares to ask new questions, the research of a scholar that defies easy answers and false truths. Yes, the holy moves in our midst if we allow ourselves to see it. Westminster College, go forth from this place changed, changed by what you have heard, 
inspired, called, ready to lend your voices, your hands, your hearts, your bodies, your very lives to the work of peace, the work of justice, the work of creating a better world. Go now knowing you are prepared, you are called. Go now in love and with a spirit of revolution, for there is much to do. Amen. Please take your seats. <clears throat> Please remain seated until the platform party and the faculty have exited the auditorium. The platform party will recess first. After a short delay, the faculty will recess under the direction of the marshals and the skulls of seven. After the faculty have recessed, the audience is dismissed. I declare the John Finley Green Foundation lecture closed.